talk about. While they continue in sin, we would never want them to do that. But yes, we can pray for them to get well. But we would also pray for them to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. You know, I've mentioned that many times. Uh, we still haven't made a section in the bulletin uh, to address this issue. But uh, oftentimes people want you to pray for everybody under the sun who might be sick. But they'll never tell you to, hey, can you put in the bulletin to pray for my son or my daughter or my cousin or whoever because they're in sin and they won't repent. Oh, no. Oh, you'd be so hate. You would be treated like uh, the scum of the earth. You would be treated as if you're the most hateful person in the world. If you listed all the people who you know who are in sin and lost and have no hope. But, you know, the truth is. We're, we'd be better off praying for them than we are for somebody who's sick because they have the flu or they have a surgery or something to that effect. It's far more important, their spiritual condition. If they don't listen or if they don't have time for the gospel, can we still pray for them? Yes, we can still pray for them. And we'll talk about that in our study today. But there are some things that we need to understand. We ought to pray for them that they repent and come to know God. So the great people of God in every generation are those who pray. The people that are praised the most in scripture are the ones who have the greatest relationship with God. It's not those who do great things physically. Our world has it backwards. We've talked about that when it comes to elderships. So oftentimes churches choose a man who's successful in business. Well, he may be immoral. That may be why he's been successful in business. He may be tyrannical, a word that's being thrown around in our society today. He may be a mistreater of people. I, I, I had a discussion recently, I won't give you any names, but someone that we know, someone that uh, has uh, been a m member of the Lord's Church, somebody that uh, has association with others, that I know that you know some of the people that are involved, but they say well, this person at work is one of the worst people they know. Foul mouth, treats people horribly, takes advantage of things. And yet, you know, in the worship and in the church assembly, so oftentimes people like that, the rest of the, the, rest of the people don't know. They don't know how sorry that individual really is. You know, that's not what being a Christian is all about. Being a Christian it means that you live it every single day in everywhere you are. And so when we pray for people, I, I say that for this reason. You really don't know what they're thinking in their heart. You don't know what they're feeling in their mind. You don't, you don't know, know those things. And so we have to be careful about that. We want to pray for people. The great people of Scripture are praying people. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. We ought to be prayerful people. Like Daniel, we ought to have a time for prayer. Daniel, when he found out the decree was signed that if you pray to God, you are going to be fed to the lions. He went to that room. He went to his window. He did what he did. And it tells us there it was his custom to do this every single day, three times a day at a set time. It would be good if we had a set time to pray, just like we have a set time. Many of you have a set time when you read your Bible. You have a set time when you eat your meals. You have a set time when you go to work. Well, why wouldn't we have a set time to pray? That's much more important than all those other things. Uh, we ought to be a people who are, are prayerful people. And so we acknowledge that we ought to be prayerful. And uh, we ought to be able to uh, express our needs to God. Show him our reliance upon him. Show him our trust and faith in him that he can deliver. And we ought to be able We're not going to talk all about prayer. We're not going to talk about all the different types of prayer. We're not going to talk about uh, how prayers are laid out in Scripture. We're not going to do all that. We're going to try to stick to this question. But I do want you to know that in the, in the future, in the near future, we are going to have a study on prayer uh, that will last several weeks. Uh, but I want to address this question. So in order to do that, let's start with, for whom shall we pray? For whom shall we pray? Let's start with 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul writing to Timothy says this, Therefore I exert, exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made. And I'm going to stop right there. If this later on when we study prayer, we'll talk about those four things and the differences in them. But for whom are these prayers made? The next phrase says that they be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may be quiet and peaceable life and all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. This is the gist of the question that's being asked. There are some people that want us to pray for them. They are not living right. 
I want to pray for them to help them physically, but I'm concerned about them spiritually. That is the question. That is the answer. Pray for them. Pray for them. That's the answer. Notice, he says pray for all men. He didn't say pray for all men regardless uh, or, or, or uh, uh, depending on their faithfulness. Regardless of their faithfulness. If they're right with God or if they're not right with God. Pray for them. Pray for all men. Then it says specifically to pray for the leadership of the land and of the world. He calls it kings and all who are in authority. Does it say pray for only the spiritually minded leaders of our land? No. It says pray for all of them. How many of them are children of God? Almost none. There are almost no people in Congress, in uh, the White House, and in our state and local governments over the history of the United States that are faithful children of God. I know some. You probably know some. But it's a very small percentile of people. He didn't say pray for the faithful leaders. You wouldn't ever pray for a leader. They're worldly people. He says pray for all kings and all who are in authority, regardless of their situation. Now why? Why would I do that? Well, he says that it's, it's so that we can have a quiet and peaceful life. We want to pray for God and his providential uh, ability to uh, affect the world, to have uh, a long-lasting uh, opportunity for peace and comfort so that we can spread the gospel. We don't want to face persecution. Even though we promised that all will suffer persecution. All faithful, 2 Timothy 3, 12. But we want it to be peaceful. We want to be able to go next door and talk to our neighbor about Christ. We want to be able to talk to people on the street about Christ. We don't want to have to hide, as they did in the first century, in worshiping God. We want to have a quiet, peaceful life. We want our government to be such that it allows the freedom of religion and the freedom to assemble. And right now, those are protected rights. And we're thankful for it, but you ought to continue to pray for them, even though they're not faithful people, so that we can have those freedoms. Why else? Because he wants all men to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. The only way to have that kind of ultimate peace is if people are Christians. If people are worldly, you're never going to have peace. The world is never going to be what it ought to be when we don't follow God. Go over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses prayer several times. But I want you to notice who else we're to pray for. Verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do, do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Who is it that we are to pray for in this passage? Our enemies. Those who spitefully use us and persecute us. Three groups of people who are not believers. These are wicked people. Why would I do that? Because I'm imitating my Father in heaven. And the things that he does, just as my Father in heaven is perfect, I shall be perfect. How does God demonstrate it? When he sends the sun, all the good, and the evil. You know that, right? Now, now I'm going to say the sun comes up in the east, but you know the sun doesn't come up, right? The earth rotates. But just to use that as a turn of the language there, the sun comes up in the east. Does it only come up on the faithful? Is the rest of the world in darkness? No, God's blessings are for all. When it rains, and it rains, you know, occasionally here in West Texas, when it rains, does it only fall on the just, or does it fall on the unjust as well? You see, God loves everyone. He loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son. Who did he send it to? Just those who will be faithful, or to the whole world? You see, if you want to be like God, and you want to love like God, you need to pray for everyone. Even those who are enemies, those who are evil, those who spitefully use you, those who persecute you. You need to pray for all of them. So again, the answer to this question is yes, you ought to pray for them. There's more to this question. We'll get to it in just a moment. But if you love people, like God loves people, you ought to pray for them. All right? Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We're going to look at chapter 9 also, but chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. What was Paul doing? He was praying for Israel to be saved, but keep praying, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness to everyone who believes. And I'll stop right there. He continues discussing the difference between the law and the gospel of Christ. But his Jewish brethren would not give up the old law and obey the gospel. They would not. They refused it. They persecuted Christians. They would eventually persecute and kill Paul. But what was his job? What did he do in verse 1? He prayed for them, even though they were lost. Now go back to chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. Paul, his concern for the countrymen was that they be saved and have the right kind of mindset, the right kind of heart, and submit to the gospel. In chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, he says, I tell you the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren and my countrymen according to the flesh. And again, you can read the rest of this context. And the discussion is, they won't leave the law behind. How did Paul feel about it? He had great sorrow and continual grief in his heart. He was torn apart, but he continued to pray for them. He wanted them to obey the truth. They kept rejecting the truth, but he prayed for them. Now listen, we could go on and on and on. But the fact is, these, these people wouldn't listen. He wanted them to hear the gospel and be saved. He wanted them to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. He wants them to be able to know the truth and obey the gospel and put on Christ in baptism. And yet they rejected it. Did, did Paul give up on them? No, he kept praying for them. He was even himself willing to be accursed so that they might be saved. But folks, it doesn't work that way. He couldn't do it, neither can you. You can't will for somebody else to be saved. You can't suffer and die so that somebody else could be saved. Christ paid that debt. It's up to them to believe and obey the gospel. So yes, we can pray for people when they have physical need, especially if they have spiritual need, and that even though they may choose not to respond to the gospel, we can pray for them. Now, the faithful child of God will also accept the biblical teaching that prayer and providence go together uh, to, uh, to help uh, people. And so the Christian's going to pray for the sick, understanding that, that God will work within that framework of natural law. Uh, you know, he's going to help us to, to get well according to his own will, if the Lord wills, as James chapter 4, verse 15 says. You know, at one time God fed multitudes from heaven. We mentioned it Wednesday night. They had manna. Manna means what is it? What is it? And they were fed every day from that bread. God fed them. But today, God still feeds us. 
You know that? How does God feed us? Well, for one, he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. You read Isaiah 55, you learn that uh, um, his ways and our ways don't always match up. But what he does is he has this cycle where the, um, the water evaporates, goes up to the clouds, it falls, and it brings water to nourish the land and cause growth of the sea. And he uses that illustration to say that God's word, when it is planted, will not return into him void, just like that water cycle that God has set on the face of the earth. God still feeds us today. How does he do that? Seeds planted, the nourishment in the ground, the nitrogen, the water that falls, um, all of it germinates, and next thing you know, you've got to sprout, and it won't be long, and it'll be a big plant, and then it'll bloom, and then the bees and the insects will do their part, and a few months later, you have fruit. How does that work? Well, God put that providential care in place, and he still feeds us today. It's, it's because of what happened in Genesis chapter 1, when God said that each plant would produce after its own kind, according to its seed. That's providential care. God still feeds us to this day. It's not manna you don't go out on your front porch and pick up whatever wafer fell that night. You, you, you go to the store, or you grow it yourself, or you go buy it at the farm and market uh, um, display, or whatever. You are still fed by God. That's providential care. Yes, we still pray for our food. Give us this day our daily bread. That's also in the Sermon on the Mount. We ought to pray for our food. We ought to pray for it with thanksgiving, Paul would say. He also would tell us that we pray when we eat. That's a good thing. Those are good things. Uh, so the principle also applies for the sick. If somebody is sick, we ought to pray for them. In fact, we pray for our infirmities, and the Lord will help us. Um, Ephesians 6, 1 uh, through 18, really verse 18. So God helps us providentially. He helps us through natural law, not miraculously. And that's why I say this today. Uh, just because we pray for them doesn't mean everything's going to work out. Uh, it might not happen the way we want it to. But... How does God help us providentially when it comes to sickness? Well, doctors, nurses, medicine, technology, um, things that have been developed, uh, the things that are going on in society today, quickly we are learning more and more and more about things like cancer, um, although we still haven't cracked that code to eliminate it. We've learned many other things that are not a problem today anymore that wiped out whole groups, whole cities, whole families of people in the past because we have some of this technology. A guy who looks to this question said, uh, said this, He who is raised up from death's door by modern drugs is assuredly healed by the power of God as those who were in the first century who were recipients of Christ's healing ministry of that day. You're still raised up by God, and we ought to give God the glory and the credit for someone getting well, but it doesn't mean he miraculously did it. Okay, but what if that person won't listen? What if they won't listen? Well, I already explained, most of the world doesn't listen. We talked about that last two weeks in our Sunday morning classes and sermons. Uh, but what if they won't listen? Well, we still pray for their hearts to be open. We still ought to pray for the word of God to, to help them, that they're tender and compassionate and willing to listen and obey. They may never hear it. They may never obey it, but we would still pray for them. So if, if someone you love is in the hospital on the deathbed, don't you pray for them to get well? Even if the doctor's prognosis is not good, don't you still pray for them to get well? Of course you would. Even to the last minute, you would still pray for them. Your prayer might change to give them comfort as they move on to the next realm. You still want to pray for them? So if somebody's in sin and they're not doing what's right, would you want to still pray for them? They're lost. I don't think that you would. We also uh, can try teaching them. If we love them, what can we say? We come to knowledge of the truth as we read a moment ago. We ought to teach the gospel to them. However, which this is part of that question, I think it's the undertone of the question, what if they just won't listen and they don't want to do anything with it? Well, there is a point in time when we may want to move on on our efforts. If they're not going to listen to us, we can still pray for them, but we probably ought to spend our time trying to teach someone else instead of wasting our time on someone like that. We want to go and do things that are more fruitful. I was talking with Eugene earlier today. You know, in business, they tell you never do something that would cost you uh, less than the, the hourly rate that you are worth. For example, the CEO will never mow his own lawn if he's smart. Let's say the CEO makes $1,000 an hour. Well, he would never go mow his lawn and take two, three hours to mow his lawn. That would cost him $50 to have somebody else do. Because in truth, it's not that he took $50 out of his pocket. It's that he took $950 out of his pocket for the time that he could have been doing something else. You don't waste your time when you can be effective in other things. That's a concept most of the world doesn't understand, and that's a concept why many people never get ahead in life. Uh, because they waste time that somebody else could take care of it, and it would be cheaper in the end because you wasted your day. You never got anything done. People who are always busy but never accomplish anything, but they need to learn that lesson. Uh, so uh, we need to make sure that we're not wasting all of our time. If you're a preacher or a teacher and you're spending your time talking to somebody for 50 years and they never obey the gospel, you wasted your time. You need to be talking to somebody else with the gospel. And the Bible teaches that. Jesus told the disciples when he sent them out on a limited condition to kick the dust off of their shoes for anyone who rejected them. Matthew 10, 13 and 14. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus said this, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Both of those passages tell you that if somebody's not going to listen, listen, and you've gone to them and you've been compassionate to them, you tried to teach them and they won't listen, it's time to move on. It's time to move on. People rejected the law, they rejected the prophets, and they rejected uh, God in the Old Testament. Now we're under the New Testament era, but when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, people rejected him and they rejected the apostles. Here we are 2,000 years later, people are still going to reject God. We cannot get bogged down being stuck on somebody who will not hear when we can go across the street and talk to somebody else who will respond to the gospel. If you get stuck with that individual and you've never talked to the one across the street who would be receptive, we own we, we some of that responsibility. I should have told them about Christ. I should have told them about the church. I should have told them about how to be saved. But I was too busy doing something that wasn't going to benefit anyone anyway. If we've told them the gospel and they will not hear it, then it's time for us to move on. I know that might sound cold. It is not cold. You've planted the seed. If they will not hear and obey, it's up to them to do what's right. So how do we handle this? We pray to God for help. We cast up all of our cares on him, for he cares for us. We pray for the lost soul that they might be saved. Jesus himself on the cross in Luke 23 and verse 34 said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do you know they weren't forgiven right then when you pray for them? In order for them to be forgiven, they're going to obey the gospel on the Pentecost, the first Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. They would hear the sermon preached. They responded to the gospel. Some 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel. We can pray for them. It's up to them to obey. Plant the seed, and maybe down the road they will obey the gospel. Additionally, people who aren't interested in Christ, his church, or the gospel, we cannot let it discourage us. Some people walk around today full of doom and gloom. The sky is falling. Nobody wants to hear this. is the worst it's ever been. Folks, stop doing that. We need to move on and tell somebody who will hear the gospel. Let's kick the dust off of our shoes. Maybe God will grant them repentance. Maybe they will come around at a later date. But we can't stop and wait. We've got to keep going with the gospel. We've got to keep doing the Lord's work. Let me repe
Christ and the prayer to God cannot be treated like a spare tire that you only use when things are bad. We need to teach them that God will listen to the prayer of the righteous man, but not to the wicked. 1 Peter 3.12 For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Only those who are faithful and true are on praying terms with God. So if we pray for someone, and we try to explain to them that their life needs to change, and yet they reject it, it's time to move on. It's time to move on. There are other people that we can love and care about. You know, it's a blessing from God that we can go to him and pray. Go to our Father and pray. We can pray for others for their health and for their spiritual health. We can pray for people who are not Christians so that they come to know the knowledge of the truth. We also have to work to try to help them get it done. We can pray for their hearts to be open and receptive. But if someone will not listen, while we may continue in prayer for them, it's time for us to move on and talk to other people about the gospel. If they're not going to listen, if they're not going to do what's right, they need to know that their soul is lost. And unless they repent, they're not going to go to heaven. Now, that's, that's not always easy to do. So in that particular discussion, we need to be prayerful to God and let our cares, our feelings, our hurts, our pains be known to God. And ask him for the help that you need. And if you need somebody to go with you and talk to them, find somebody who can go with you and talk to them. But if they will not listen, it's time to move on. Continue to pray for them. But there's no reason arguing with somebody who doesn't want to change. I think we all understand that. But I hope I answered this question. Uh, I want to give it more time than some of the others just because it's a deep, deep question. And really, we can break down each section of that and spend hours on it because of how serious the subject is. So now if you're not a child of God, you need to become one. You can't do that by prayer. You have to obey the gospel. You have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. If you're already a Christian but you're not living like you should, you need to repent of that. And the way you do that is you go to God and ask for forgiveness, and He's faithful and just will you from all unrighteousness. Well, certainly, we need to take it seriously. We're, we're looking at someone who will not respond in our question. But what about us? Are we willing to respond? Excuse me. I have a preacher friend that posted something on Facebook yesterday saying something to the effect of um, people and their self righteousness. <coughs> the discussion was people have been sitting in the pew for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Never, ever, ever, ever have they asked for the prayers of the church. What does that say? Does it mean you've never sinned? You spent 50, 60, 70 years as a child of God and you never made a mistake? I think it's a thought-provoking question. I also think probably most of us, when we recognize we've done something, we go to God like that and pray for it. You, know, you don't always have to come forward on Sunday to go to God and ask for forgiveness. But if there is something that you've done in a public way that needs public confession of sins, we'd love to pray with you and for you. If there's something you need help with, we want to help you with that. That's what family uh, should do. We want to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So if you need the prayers of the church, if you need to put on Christ in baptism, you ought to take it seriously. And you ought to get it done now. We're not promised tomorrow. And so if we can help you in any way this evening, won't you come right now while we stand and while we sing? I'm a